Hey guys, welcome back to the channel and Happy New Year! If you're new here, my name is Ali, I'm a final year medical student at Cambridge University and this is the third video in our series about medical ethics and today we're going to be talking about euthanasia and medical ethics at the end of life. We're going to be talking about these topics in two videos. In this video, we're going to be focusing on what is arguably the most well-known case in the UK. We're going to be introducing some terms like active euthanasia, passive euthanasia, physician-assisted suicide and explaining what those terms are and more importantly, how to use them appropriately because I think there is a lot of confusion surrounding those terms and a lot of medicine applicants seem to to be using them in kind of the wrong context. And we're going to be explaining the law in the UK as it stands at the moment. So, the legal status of euthanasia and physician-assisted suicide, and we're going to be talking about the doctrine of double effect. If you haven't heard of these terms before, that's absolutely fine. All of it should hopefully make sense by the end of the video. And then in part two, in the next video, which should be out at some point next week, we're going to be talking about assisted suicide and cases where people have tried to change the law surrounding assisted suicide and the ethics associated with that. So, let's just jump right into it. We're now going to cut to a video of Charlotte and Molly, who you might know from the last two videos and they're going to be introducing to us the case of Lillian Boyd. Here we go. So I want you to imagine that you're a consultant at the hospital. You've been treating this patient who's called Lillian for many years um, and she's suffering terribly with arthritis and she's she's a palliative patient. She's someone who is never going to get better and all we're trying to do is relieve her symptoms. So one day on ward round Lillian says to you as her consultant I am in so much pain and I am suffering so much that I just don't want to live anymore. I want you to do something that will end my life today. What do you do as a doctor in that situation? You know this patient really well, you can see that they're really suffering, that their symptoms aren't being managed and they're desperate that their life would end to relieve them of the suffering. What would you do in that scenario? So this is actually a real case from 1992 um, and th this was Dr Nigel Cox and he was asked by Lillian to do this thing to end her life in order to relieve her suffering. And it's become one of those seminal cases that we talk about a lot um, in discussions around euthanasia um, and end of life care for patients. So we'll be going back and forth to this case as we go through explaining end of life care and ethics around euthanasia and assisted dying. Um, and we'll tell you what happened as we go along. So that's the case. Um, have a think about it. Think about what you might do in that scenario. Um, a little bit more information that might help you. Uh, this is the most severe case of rheumatoid arthritis you've ever seen in your life. And you really admire Lillian's resilience uh, in the face of her condition. Previously, she was always kind of taking things rather well, being good humored about the whole thing. But now it's sort of gotten to the point where she really can't take the suffering anymore and is an unbearable agony. On top of her rheumatoid arthritis, she's got internal bleeding, she's got septicemia, she's got vasculitis, which is causing her internal organs to become gangrenous and is further contributing to her suffering. And her two sons, Patrick and John, are by her bedside and they and all three of them are begging you to expediently end her life, to relieve her suffering. What would you do? So if you were asked this or something similar in an interview, you could go with the four principles approach, you know, the structure that we always recommend for answering medical ethics scenarios that we mentioned in the first video. So in this scenario, we've got kind of the four principles at odds with one another. Uh, the principle of non-maleficence, not doing harm, and the principle of beneficence, doing good. They're sort of in conflict because ending someone's life isn't really doing good. And you could argue that ending someone's life is not doing harm because you're relieving their suffering. But you could also argue that, you know, ending someone's life is precisely the definition of doing harm. And then autonomy and justice come into it. Autonomy, the patient wants this. This is clearly what the patient wants. The patient's family wants this. So in terms of autonomy, we should surely be helping her end her life. But in terms of justice, we can ask about, you know, fair allocation of resources and just kind of fairness in general. Is it fair? for us to take the life of another human being, regardless of what the intention is. So this is a really tricky case, and this is the case that's going to hopefully form the undercurrent of this video, and we're going to be kind of referring back to it as we explain things in, in a bit more detail. So in your interview, if you're asked something like this, yeah, you could go with the four principles approach, but everyone is going to be doing that. So if you know a little bit more, if you can give a little bit more about arguments surrounding euthanasia and assisted suicide, then you're definitely going to be standing out. So, to that end, let's introduce some terms now, and Charlotte and Molly are now going to explain what active euthanasia, passive euthanasia, and physician-assisted suicide, what those terms actually mean and how you should use them. Here we go. So, euthanasia literally means a good death. And there are some, some terms that people use um, that we just want to clarify. So you'll hear people talking about active euthanasia. And active euthanasia is when you actually do something with the intent of ending someone's life. So that would be, for example, um, 
injecting a drug that does nothing else but kill someone. So that's active euthanasia. Now you'll hear people talking about passive euthanasia, but we don't think that's a particularly helpful term to use. Because passive euthanasia, people mean that you're doing something um, like withdrawing or withholding treatment that results in someone dying, but calling it euthanasia is not helpful at all because euthanasia is illegal. But withdrawing or withholding treatment in a patient's best interest is good clinical practice. And so what we'd advise you to say is active euthanasia is definitely illegal, but withdrawing or withholding treatment in accordance with a patient's best interests is good clinical practice and is what happens up and down the country in every hospital every day. Okay, so there's also a third term uh, called physician assisted suicide. And in this instance, um, it involves a physician, so a doctor, um, providing a patient with a treatment which is going to end their life but the doctor does not actually physically give them the treatment the patient actually takes it themselves so this is a physician assisted suicide and this is also illegal in the UK so so active euthanasia passive euthanasia and physician assisted suicide all of those things are illegal in the UK because the intent is to end someone's life and intending to end someone's life constitutes murder. So all illegal in the UK. But as we've said, withdrawing or withholding treatment is good medical practice and is not illegal if it's done in accordance with the best, best interests of the patient. Okay, so we've defined some terms and I just want to reiterate, please don't use the phrase passive euthanasia. Passive euthanasia is so confusing because as they said, passive euthanasia, we think of it as, you know, unplugging, unplugging a life support machine. But something is only ever defined as euthanasia if your intent is to end their life. And if your intent is to end someone's life, then that is murder and that is illegal in the UK. Withdrawing treatment is not the same thing as passive euthanasia, so please don't get those two terms confused. And in fact, what we all suggest is just never ever use the term passive euthanasia because it's just hugely confusing. Withdrawing treatment is good medical practice in some circumstances. It's not illegal. It is a good thing to do. The thing about withdrawing treatment is that, and the reason why it's so confusing, is that often withdrawing treatment will result in someone's life ending. But your intent when you're withdrawing the treatment must be that you think clinically that the, the treatment itself is no longer in the best interest of the patient. So there's an important distinction here. You're not saying that continuing to live is no longer in the patient's best interest. You're saying that the treatment in particular that you are currently giving them is, not, is no longer in their best interests. So if they're plugged up to a load of machines, then you can make the argument that, you know, the suffering caused by being plugged up to loads of these machines is no longer in your best interests. Yes, if you unplug those machines, the patient will probably die. But your intent is to relieve their suffering because the treatment is not in their best interests. Your intent is not to end their life. And yeah, a lot of people say that this distinction is just arguing over the semantics, like what difference is there between me saying that I'm gonna unplug the life support machine to end their life versus I'm gonna unplug the life support machine because I think the life because I think the life support machine is no longer in their best interests. And kind of we can we can argue about this all day. The point is at the moment in the UK, your intent cannot be to end their life. Your intent must be that you are withdrawing treatment because you think the treatment is no longer in their best interests. So we've defined some terms. Uh, we've said that please never ever use the phrase passive euthanasia when talking about this whole topic. Now let's go back to Dr. Cox and here's Charlotte and Molly again. Okay, so going back to Dr. Cox, um, what actually ended up happening was he injected a drug um, and Lillian died shortly afterwards. Um, it couldn't be determined necessarily whether she definitely died because of the drug he injected or not because she was so poorly at the time. Um, but that is what happened. Um, so thinking about Dr. Cox's defence legally, how might he have defended himself um, doing what he did? Because it sounds like what he did was active euthanasia, which we've just said is completely illegal in the UK. Um, he gave her a drug and she subsequently died. Um, but actually there is uh, one example where this, this might be a loophole. Um, it's called the doctrine of double effect. And what it means is that um, it's based on your intentions essentially. So a lot of patients nearing the end of their life are on quite high doses of some quite serious drugs. Um, and those drugs could, um, if we give them in high enough quantities, actually shorten the patient's life. It's worth noting that actually 
we need to give sufficient amounts of drugs to make sure that a patient is comfortable at this time. It's paramount that we don't let patients die in distress and in an undignified manner. And so it should be allowed, legally it is allowed, for doctors to give quite high amounts of these drugs. So the point of the doctrine of double effect is that even if a doctor gives a drug knowing that it may shorten a patient's life, if their intent is to give that drug in order to improve their symptoms and to make them more comfortable, and their intent is not to shorten their life, then that is considered legal in the UK. You hear this quite a lot in relation to morphine, a very strong painkiller, um, and actually um, all the research has suggested that if we use morphine properly, um, it doesn't shorten people's lives. And so in reality, this, this isn't really used as a defense. But if we think about going back to, to Nigel Cox again, um, it, would, it would absolutely not have been a defense for him, even if he tried. So what Nigel Cox actually did was use a drug called potassium chloride. Now potassium chloride is good for one thing and one thing only, and that's stopping someone's heart. There is no other symptomatic relief to be gained from injecting potassium chloride. And so by using that substance, Dr. Cox um, was never going to be able to use the doctrine of double effect as any sort of defense. Okay, so that's the doctrine of double effect. And that's an important concept to, to understand in this whole debate about euthanasia and assisted suicide. The thing with the doctrine of double effect, though, is that it's, it is mostly a theoretical argument these days. Um, palliative care has gotten to the point where we're very rarely prescribing drugs that have the side effect of shortening someone's life. Uh, there is very little evidence that morphine in particular shortens people's lives, that's the most famous one that people think of. There is a small amount of evidence maybe that benzodiazepines, uh, drugs that reduce people's agitation towards the end of life, there is some evidence that maybe those might reduce their life and maybe in those cases you might apply the doctrine of double effect. But in general, the vast majority of palliative care patients we don't need to shorten their life in order to relieve their suffering. Um, so the doctrine of double effect is, as we said, mostly a theoretical concept in these cases. So we've defined the doctrine of double effect. Let's now talk about what happened to Dr. Cox. So we'll tell you a bit more about what actually happened in the case of Dr. Cox. Um, so although we've said that he couldn't use the uh, doctrine of double effect as a legal argument in this case, um, it was eventually found that he was not he was guilty. Okay. He, was, he was guilty of manslaughter, not murder. Okay. It was eventually found that he was guilty of manslaughter, but not murder. And that's because, as we said earlier on, it wasn't clear whether Lillian would have died with or without his injection, because she was so ill anyway. Um, so he was found guilty of manslaughter. He was actually given a suspended sentence, so he didn't go to prison for this. Um, and he wasn't actually struck off um, from the GMC, so he's still maybe practicing now, he has definitely been practicing since this happened in the 1990s. Um, so what we can learn from this is that this is a particularly uh, difficult ethical case and sometimes in the law, although things like active euthanasia are strictly illegal, in certain instances um, we can start to appeal to what other doctors would have done and other doctors might actually uh, sympathise with how horrifically difficult this decision was for Dr Cox um, and therefore his sentence has been slightly more lenient. So what we're saying is that none of these situations are clear cut and they can um, all be fought differently in the courts and all come out differently depending on the uh, specific situation that you find yourself in. So yeah, so that was the case and let's be clear about this, we're not advocating what Dr Cox did, we're not saying what he did was right. We're saying what he did was strictly, strictly illegal, but we're conceding that, yeah, this was a terribly difficult position to be put in, and a position that, you know, us as clinicians, we would never want to be put in that position. Um, it was a very difficult decision he had to make, and he did what he thought was right at the time. And, you know, you can form your own personal opinion as to whether you think it was a good thing he did or a bad thing he did. The fact of the matter was, it was illegal. Um, maybe should the law be changed? I don't know, that's that's a topic of debate and that's kind of what we're going to be talking about in the next video. Incidentally, at Dr. Cox's trial, uh, they called up two eminent rheumatologists who were given the facts of the case and they were asked what they would have done in that circumstance. Uh, one of them got too distressed and wasn't able to answer the question. 
and the second one said that he wished he would have had the courage to do what Dr. Cox did in that circumstance. So I'll just leave it at that. You can form your own conclusions uh, from, from all the facts that we've, that we've told you so far. And we'll put a link to the Wikipedia article. You can read more about this. I think it's hugely interesting. Uh, and if you're interested, then yeah, you can follow that link. So this concludes our first admittedly quite heavy video about end of life and euthanasia. We've talked about the current legal status of euthanasia in the UK. It is illegal, 100% definitively. There is like, there are pretty much no two ways about it. We've talked about the doctrine of double effect. We've defined some terms. We've said that passive euthanasia is not the same thing as withdrawing treatment. Withdrawing treatment is good medical practice in some circumstances. Passive euthanasia is always illegal. And throughout the video, we've been referencing the case of Dr. Cox and the really, really difficult dilemma associated with it. And if you get asked something about euthanasia in your interviews, you can reference the four principles of medical ethics as you should, because it's a great way of structuring your answer. But now you can draw in a little bit more about what you know about the, the legal status of euthanasia and a little bit more about maybe referencing the Dr. Cox case if you feel like it, if it kind of goes in with the flow of your interview. And that would really help you stand out, I think. Uh, one MMI scenario that I've heard some, some universities ask, uh, it's, it's quite mean because it, you really shouldn't be expected to have this level of knowledge uh, at your stage of the application. But one MMI scenario that I heard was there was a patient, um, you were a doctor and you had to kind of explain to a patient who asked you uh, that he wanted to end his life. So the scenario was kind of what would you do in that circumstance? And a way to answer that is, I think, I think what they want you to say is firstly, you would, you would want to kind of explore the patient's concerns, like ask them why they're feeling that way, really try and get to the bottom of it. Um, ultimately, if they press you, you do have to say that you're, you're bound by the law, that you know ending someone's life is illegal in the UK. And you can kind of explain that palliative care is really good these days. A lot of patients are afraid of maybe dying in pain, dying in suffering, dying unable to breathe. And generally, palliative care is really, really good. We can generally deal with most of these symptoms. So that's how I would tackle one of these MMI scenarios. But to be honest, if you get something like that, that's really mean. That's more like a final year medical student, what they would get in their final OSCEs, rather than what you should really get as a medicine applicant. But hey, you've got the information now if you do get hit with that quite mean scenario. So that brings us to the end of this video. Thank you very much for watching. We've said that euthanasia is strictly illegal in the UK, but people have tried over the last few years to change the law in the UK. I personally think the law should be changed in the UK in favor of maybe allowing a little bit more leeway for, for euthanasia, for physician-assisted suicide. And that's gonna be the subject of the next video. We're gonna be introducing these cases of people who've tried to change the laws. We've, we're gonna be talking about why they've tried to change the law. We're gonna be talking about the ethics of assisted suicide. So yeah, I hope you found this video useful. If you did, please give it a thumbs up. Uh, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please consider doing so. Have a lovely day and I'll see you next time.